Welcome to Drum and Drummer, a podcast focused on drums, drumming and drummers. I'm George Pickering and that's Ben Winty and we are both professional drummers in this business we call music. So stick around and join us as we pass the time whilst trying to stay in time. Yeah, but that's because you're dead inside. You don't want to play anymore. Welcome to Drum and Drummer with me, George Pickering, and that's Ben Winty. Yo, what's up? Wow, there yeah, you go. I went There's... in there with the... Uh, I grew Slang? up in the streets. Yeah, Sandy Lane, to be precise, in the little village <laughs> the of Titchfield. Streets of... <laughs> the streets of Titchfield. Uh, very exciting show today. We've got on yeah. um, Steve we've got our, Yeah, we've got our first international guest. Yep. So that's pretty special for us, isn't it? It is. All the we way record. from um, sunny LA, California. Yeah. yeah. Should we just dive right into it? Well, um, Steve has written a book. He has. What's the book called, George? It's called Forbidden Beat, Perspectives on Punk Drumming. He was kind enough to send us a copy, and yeah. uh, it's fascinating. He got in touch with us and said, I've written this book about punk drumming. Sent us yep. a copy. Yep. Which is great. Yep. Uh, I read so it. we were like, let's have a chat. Yeah, let's have so, a chat. Um, we had our first international call. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, we've had a great, it was fascinating. I it mean, was fascinating. You know, what, what, he, what he knows about punk drumming and the history of drumming and, and about his own sort of drumming career. Um, yeah. You know, it was, uh, it was great. So we'll just crack straight on it. Yep. yep. Enjoy. Yeah. First of all, thanks for coming on the show. Oh, thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Our um, our first international guest. So uh, yeah, yeah, very grateful for. Um, we worked out the time difference, so it's it's morning there in California, and uh, a nice Sunday evening here in uh, south coast of England. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I co-hosted a podcast for a couple of years about crime fiction, and every time we interviewed somebody in the UK, we got the time totally wrong, and they would be on at like 3 o'clock in the morning, and we were like, oh, we got the time zones wrong. So thank you guys for being on top of it. That's okay, no worries. Now, first of all, this book, I mean, I have it here. You kindly sent us a copy. It's its fantastic. I, I felt it almost, it reads like a great punk song. It's fast-paced, and it's, it's never, in the way that some music biographies can be almost slow and very you know challenging to read this was quick and it was it was great because you have i mean perspectives on punk drumming from everyone you know from the start of i mean you know in the 70s through to the 80s where it changed and uh even up to you know today and in the interviews and everything first of all i mean how did this book come about because you mentioned it was a labor of love and i'm sure it was um yeah, what what was the first idea behind it, and uh, how long did it take to create? Would you say? Well, thank you first of all for the kind words. I think you kind of got what I was going for um, when I originally conceived of the concept. There was a brief moment where I was like, "I'll write a really well researched, sort of bloated, deep dive, all from my perspective." And uh, what I realized pretty quickly was that that did, wouldn't interest me as a reader. I read a lot of music nonfiction. And what I wanted to hear was people who've been around it across the decades, specifically talking about punk drumming and putting their focus on this very niche topic. Um, so I, I shifted gears pretty quickly to that. And I'm glad that you picked up on that because it is meant to be fast paced. It's people joke that it's a, a, a toilet book, meaning, you know, you can just pop in and out of chapters and, and read things very fast. Or maybe if you're on your morning commute kind of thing, if you want to move out of the bathroom that I, I did two previous collections about uh, a musical genre called power pop that followed a similar format that was much more essay based. Um, and I co-edited those with Paul Myers, who's a really well-known power pop musician and, uh, and writer and editor. And my original inclination was to write an essay for the first book about power pop drummers like Bunny Carlos and Clem Burke. And then I met Ira Elliott from Not A Surf and just saw his passion for the topic and his deep love of Ringo Starr and the Beatles. And so I gave that essay to him for the first book, which is called Go All The Way. And the, but, the, but the seed had been planted and I knew as an editor and as a writer that I would eventually want to write something about drumming specifically because that's the instrument that I've always played. And so when my publisher was asking for new book ideas, I turned it into a punk book and then we were kind of off to the races. Took about 18 months, start to finish. Fantastic. And the people, I mean, the people in the book that you interviewed, were they all people you knew already? Or did you have to sort of 
find people to interview that you've perhaps been a fan of for years and then, you know, got the chance to talk to for the first time? I mean, as a fan, the, the most exciting part for me was having an excuse to reach out to people that I idolized. Yeah. Right. Even if they didn't end up in the book, which there were some who did not end up in the book, but I got to have a phone call with them or I got to trade emails with them. And everybody was really cool. You know, I thought I was going to have to explain the concept because it is a little bit different than your traditional format for a book. Um, but everybody was really supportive. It was just a matter of whether or not they had time. I knew some of the people. I mean, I've, I've been playing in bands since the 80s. Um, so I had some connection. I had some experience. But other people I knew I just wanted in the book who were my heroes or either have them in the book or have them written about in the book. So like somebody like Bill Stevenson from uh, Descendants, huge hero of mine. But I was lucky enough to get Jim Ruland, who is a really well-known punk journalist, uh, has worked for Razor Cake, co-wrote the Keith Morris book, just wrote the SST book. Um, he wrote about Bill Stevenson, and I thought that was a really good fit. And what was important to me was that it wasn't just drummers, right? That I started off with the concept that this was going to be a book about punk rock drumming. But as I got into it, what I realized was it's really a book about the history of punk rock as told from behind the drum kit. So it adds a different perspective. But then once I did that, I wanted to be able to talk to Mike Watt about the drummers he's played with. I wanted to be able to talk to Stephen McDonald from Red Cross and the Melvins and off about the drummers that he's played with. And I also wanted uh, really experienced music writers to tell me about their favorite punk rock drummers as well. Yeah, of course. I mean, that definitely came through. And I think a theme that really resonated and came through the book the whole way through was the aspect of being self-taught and, you know, the idea that punk rock, I mean, a lot of it is do it yourself. I mean, there's a brilliant bit, even in the foreword by, is it Lucky Lair? Le I can't Lucky Lehrer, who was the original drummer for the Circle Jerks. Yeah, that was it. And he mentioned, uh, you know, a drummer putting together a kit that had, you know, a different part from every different drum brand and stuff and all the way throughout the book it's you know drummers were sort of self-taught and i've heard this you know this idea of you know if you want to get in a band and you start with mates a punk band is a great place to start because it's that low barrier of entry and uh and i think even you know it's that it's having perhaps not the best skill behind it um in your playing can actually make for a you know a very unique sound uh which is something that came across in in the book would you say that is almost what the essence of punk rock is it's that i mean especially in the drums it's sort of the do-it-yourself attitude and you know it's uh let's see if we could make a band and let's see what happens uh, especially initially i think that that's definitely true right like i think in the um in the 70s when you see it start to spring up in in london and new york uh, and a couple other pl places around the uh, the world, definitely that spirit was there. It was like, I fell in love with rock and roll and I'm going to start a band tomorrow and, you know, chops be damned. Um, and I don't think that's just isolated to drums. I think punk rock in general was, let's just strip it down to the bolts yeah. um, initially. And you don't, there are no rules. Rock and roll was never supposed to have rules. And then over the course of time, it became very rule-based to the point where you you got prog rock and it's no knock on prog rock. People who like, and who like and like to listen to and like to play prog rock, that's great. But the initial spirit of rock and roll was like about this like compulsion to express yourself in the face of what society and culture is doing, right? And I, I always felt like punk rock kind of brought it back around to that. Like it was like them hitting the reset button. Specifically in the book, I think you did pick up on something. Um, I know my personal experience was I wanted to be a drummer for a while before I finally got the courage to get some drums and just start playing. I was always scared because my older brothers had been feeding me this sort of steady diet of like heavy metal and classic rock. Um, and it just seemed like an impossible task to get to that level. Um, but then once I discovered punk rock, I was like, oh, I can, I can do this tomorrow and I can just join a band with my friends. Um, and, and it was nice to see that reverberated throughout the interviews and the essays and the conversations that I had with the book. You look at somebody like Lynn Perko Trull who was, you know, against all odds, a female hardcore drummer in the very early 80s, which, you know, there weren't a lot of them. And she gets invited to join an all-female hardcore band and she doesn't have drums. So she literally, for the first few practices, flipped over trash cans. Um, and that was how their sound started. Um, there's a, a young drummer named Sherry Page who plays in a band right now called Thick. And they're all in their 20s and they're signed to Epitaph and they play punk rock. They're fantastic. I, I encourage you to check them out. 
She knew she wanted to be a drummer when she was a little kid, but couldn't convince her parents to get her drums. So like she uh, she saved up her babysitting money and bought her own first drum set. Uh, Rat Scabies from The Damned is talking about in the late 60s, he wanted to play drums really badly, but there were there was no access to drums. He would joined the school band and they'd make him play clarinet. And he, and he joined this other organization and they'd make him play horns. So he got basically instruments from like, you know, uh, whisks and spoons and stuff and just beat on pillows and taught himself that way. So it's really where there's a will, there's a way. And the, the low barrier entry to me is what makes punk endlessly regenerative. There's always going to be new punk rock because there's always going to be an opportunity for a 14 year old kid or a group of 14 year old kids to fall in love with punk rock or music and start a band the next day. All you need is a band name and the will, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Definitely. I mean, where do you see, I mean, you obviously have substantial knowledge on punk rock. I mean, before this book, but now obviously after, you know, creating this book, where would you say, this might be a tricky question, punk rock is heading, if that's even possible to answer? Yeah, I mean, and I think it's easy to answer in the context of the book, at least. I did notice a progression in the way that punk rock approached drumming over the decades and how it changed, mm. right? Because I mean, when you, you're in the proto-punk era, what you're really talking about is guys taking their cues from 50s and 60s garage rock and rock and roll, uh, sort of the straight eights kind of come into it. And you get you get drummers like Scott Ashton from the Stooges and Dennis Thompson from the MC5 and, and Jerry Nolan from the New York Dolls and the Heartbreakers. But they're playing rock and roll, right? They're playing straight ahead rock and roll. It might be stripped down a little bit more than where rock was going at that time. But they're taking their cues from people like, uh, you know, Ringo Starr and mm -hmm. Keith Moon and Ginger Baker, right? Because that was who, around, who was around. Oddly, uh, jazz drummers get mentioned quite a lot by punk drummers, especially early on. You know, Jerry Jerry Nolan was really into um, not Buddy Rich, but uh, what's his name? God, my, it's escaping me right now. But these jazz drummers that come up over and over, they're the early influences. And then you get to the point in the 70s where it's like Tommy Ramone and it's just like straight ahead. He's barely hitting cymbals and he's not doing fills. Right. And that kind of ends up becoming this template for rock and roll. I mean, for punk rock. And then hardcore comes along. They speed up the tempos incredibly. Uh, it becomes a lot more rule based. That's where you get the idea of the forbidden beat. That's where you get the idea of like the D beat coming into fashion. Um, and then pop punk comes along later on and they they kind of blend in the original rock and roll and British invasion stuff with some of the hardcore stuff. There's a lot more fills. You know, you get uh, Travis Barker, who's obviously a fantastic drummer coming along and blending all those styles together. Um, a guy like Derek Plord, who was the drummer for Lagwagon, which is a skate punk band from the late 80s and through the 90s, and they're still touring today. Uh, they actually might be on tour in the UK right now. Derek Plord, their original drummer, like basically brought a progressive rock approach uh, into punk rock. And it found it fundamentally changes what punk rock drumming is. He's an example of that. So punk rock evolves. It, it goes in a lot of different directions, you know, and uh, there are subgenres that form out of it. And there are mashups where heavy metal and, and punk rock start to be blend together. And you kind of can't tell the difference anymore, what the genre distinctions are. What I see today sort of post the pop punk peak, it's a lot of peas. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, what you see today is it's all still happening. It's just kind of happening underground again, right? Because it's not in the spotlight the way that it was before. And guitar rock in general has kind of taken a, a backseat in, in popular culture. But when I reached out to people who are much younger than me to talk about this book, the way they talk about punk rock and how it inspired them and what it means to them doesn't sound much different than the way I would have sounded if you asked me at 20. Yeah. Well, that's fair enough. I mean, Ben and I, our background in how we got raised on punk was very much Blink-182 and Green Day. And it was it was when it came to the mainstream, um, perhaps through, through those bands, it, it then opened the door for me to then look back and go, oh, these bands were, you know, copying the bands from the 70s and uh, and things like that. It's um, So, yeah, it definitely... Do you think when it came to the mainstream, that was... I mean, I almost want to say punk purists. Did they almost see it was a bad thing that it became so popular? Or was it perhaps, did you see it as a good thing that punk was suddenly on radio and almost softened a bit? 
you know, I was never, and I, and I am not now, and I never was even as a kid, any kind of purist, you no. know, because the minute I got into music and was interested in playing it in a band, then I was going to check out everything, right? I was just going to soak up information and soak up different genres and styles of playing in different eras. So I was never much of a purist. Um, I was around people who were like that, right? Like I grew up in Southern California in the specific area in Hermosa Beach, where, you know, hardcore punk and SST records is seen as being founded, the home of Black Flag and the Circle Jerks and bands like that. Um, and there was definitely some rules around that and, and people thinking this is punk rock and anything that diverges from this is not punk rock. The truth of the matter is I, I was a guy who always liked a pop hook and I am still a sucker for a pop hook. And I was also exactly the right age to watch punk rock go from its forming, turn into hardcore and then ride that wave through college rock and into pop punk. So when pop punk hit, not only did I think it was great, I was ecstatic that it was mainstream music because I wanted more people to hear it. And I love that those guys were writing hooks in their songs. Like I can still listen to Green Day today and, and feel no shame about it and then put on a Black Flag record. Like it's just good music is good music to me. I, yeah, um, definitely. play uh, in a covers band. We play weddings and... <laughs> I've been doing that for about 10 years, but a couple of years ago, I had the idea that, you know, my age, I'm mid thirties. I grew up when I first got into music. Yeah. It was older friends, older brothers, you know, they had green day Nirvana. Um, we also had the Brit pop, you know, Oasis and things like that. And that's how we got into it. And we'd go in, my mate shared and they had a few instruments and it was like, let's try and learn how to play basket case and smells like teen spirit. And, and I kind of thought, well, a lot of people, my age, getting married you know hitting their 30s grew up with this pop punk era that that was in the mainstream so it really did permeate into people's minds and hearts and and so i was like this is very unique but i want to set up a wedding band that is entirely pop punk it's entirely that genre so we kick things off straight away with blink 182 you know there's green day there's bowling for soup some 41 even you know foo fighters and nirvana and rage against the machine and we've now since covid we've now actually been able to start you know playing these weddings and and people's reactions to to this stuff is is so positive then they're, they're sort of reliving their, their their youth you know through from the noughties and we actually just did a gig last night and for the first time we played a, a bowling for soup song um high school never ends yeah and and having to sort of learn these songs intricately like what the drums actually do and it's now looking back with sort of 20 year glasses on and going, these songs aren't just, they don't just capture that era for me in terms of nostalgia, but the quality of the songwriting. And it's, it's just, you know, it's one of those things. It's just not easy to do. And then you realize, and some 41 going back and really listening to their stuff like properly, you're like, wow, this, this is some good shit, you know? And, yeah. Um, and the drumming as well, especially I think some 41 drummer is, is phenomenal, you know? And give it giving me a challenge, you know, I've got to replicate yeah. <laughs> his stuff. I play, you know, other bands and we're playing modern stuff and old stuff and the drumming's it's a four four rock beat. But when you're starting to like have to emulate Travis Barker and, and some forty one and some of these bands and you know, um you're kinda of like these guys really, really could play. Yeah. yeah, many of them still can, right? Yeah. Like many, yeah. many of them are still out there doing it either in their original band or three bands later, like you look at somebody like Brooks Wackerman, who like played during this big peak for Bad Religion, um, who uh, Ian Winwood actually writes about him in in, in this book. Um, he's now playing with Avenged Sevenfold, which is a progressive rock band, right? It's a progressive metal band. Yeah. He's playing really intricate stuff. But you also hear that in the stuff he played on in Bad Religion. I, I'm impressed that you're playing in a band that does that for a few reasons. One, just taking two of the bigger names, Travis, the way Travis Barker approaches drums is wildly different than the way that Trey Cool approaches drumming, right? And there's all these flavors in between, but that era of pop punk is where you start to see the rise of the superstar punk drummer, yeah. right? And they've, they're a lot of flash, a lot of flair, a lot of fills, a lot of accents. The band's kind of holding down a chugging old school all downstroke kind of punk rock mode, but the drummers are going insane. Yeah. Um, and so that's, you know, good on you for being able to play that stuff. Cause to tell you the <laughs> truth, I'm not sure I could keep up with it. I have days. a, I have a good go. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Some of the blink stuff, like, you know, even just playing, even, you know, in the 
verse or a chorus, you're just playing a steady beat, but it's so fast that the, the right hand is is going at some some rate of knots. And Travis was one of those drummers when I was younger that stood out instantly. You know, I love Blink, and one of the first albums I bought was Enemy of the State, and and it was just like, wow, the drums are really they're so in, integral to you know the the quality and I guess like the impact that band had in terms of yes the songs are don't want to put them down by saying straightforward but they're sort of quite simple catchy mm -hmm. pop band songs but there's just absolute chaos going on in the drums and I often wonder like I mean would they be where they were without Travis it's hard to say I mean if you can say Blink 182 to most passive fans and it's one of the only bands that they can immediately name the drummer like, you know, yeah. we're all drummers, you know, we're not, we're not the superstars in most bands, but when you say Blink-182, people will immediately point to Travis Barker. I think tr same is true with Green Day that like right away, people will say Trey Cool. They'll just know that name. And I like what you were saying about sort of like how it, getting into this music kind of let you go backwards, right? Like that was my experience of it. It's a portal into this whole universe. Um, and, and Trey Cool talks about that a little bit, like him being a teenager and uh, when I interviewed him in the book, him being a teenager and starting to play for the lookouts and he's never really played drums before and he's just bashing away and they're like, literally, we're going to take your cymbals away from you and you can earn them back. Um, yeah. He had to learn how to keep a beat first, right? But the first thing they did was basically at the time, make him a mixtape and go, these are the bands we want to sound like and these are the drummers you should pay attention to. And I think to some degree, that's what we all do. That's how we learn. We replicate, we imitate what we're attracted to and try to incorporate it into the way that we play and develop our style about that so there's there's something beautiful in rock and roll but it's more noticeable in punk rock this idea of a stylistic relay race where everybody's kind of taking a little bit from what became before and handing a little bit of that forward and you can kind of see the progression especially in putting a book like this together how that actually plays out stylistically across the decades definitely and i think that was very much shown in the the difference between punk in 77 to punk in 82 when was that when the d beat and the forbidden beat were sort of at the core of punk because that was something i hadn't really heard about to be honest and i think it was described as the d beat sort of made bands just sound another level in punk it's someone described it as it was it made the sex pistol sound like take that you know it took it yeah. to another level um i wonder if we could almost just talk about the d beat and the forbidden beat for a minute just because that was something that I hadn't, I'd heard it before. I'd obviously heard it in punk songs, but I didn't know that was what it was called. Could you possibly describe what the D beat and the forbidden beat Yeah, I'm sure are? like like ourselves, you know, I think when I had a had a, a little dive into what the D beat was and I was like, oh, I know what that is. I just never knew mm -hmm. it was called that or it's sort of where it came in, in sort of the history of, of, of drumming. And I'm sure there's, you know, plenty of listeners we've got who will, once they hear it, go, oh, yeah, I've, I've yeah. heard that before. But, you know, you you know about it, its sort of origins and, and where it, you know, it's it's um, when it made its appearance. So it'd be great if, yeah, if you could sort of explain a bit about those two beats, that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I will say that I learned a lot myself from Matt Deal, who wrote the essay in the book about yeah. this. He's a, a diehard fan of Discharge. And Discharge is an English punk band that gets credited with basically making the D beat, everybody aware of the D beat um, and really incorporating it overall into the band sound. Uh, although people will point to the Buzzcocks, a song called You Tear Me Up, uh, where John Marr is playing um, this really kind of uh, idiosyncratic beat. And you read in, uh, you read interviews with him and, and he'll say that I just couldn't keep up with the pace of the song. And so I had to improvise to kind of get through it. And it ends up giving it this like loping, loping sort of herky jerky feel that's not straight on the ones and twos and threes and fours. So, I mean, the basic difference is the forbidden beat uh, and, and there are even arguments about what is and what isn't the forbidden beat, but the forbidden beat is like what you'd think of like minor threat or dead Kennedy's. It's like really fast, uh, basically a fast umpa beat, right? It stays on the one, two, three, four. And then the D beat has a lot more of the accents on the ands between the one and two and three and four, and will build those beats on floor toms and cymbals in ways that sound kind of out of the, out of the, the norm for the way a drummer would think about rhythm. So it creates this sort of galloping, more idiosyncratic beat. 
so that you've got the one that's super straight right on the metronome, and then you've got the other one that's galloping a little bit. And those kind of become the two dominant uh, drum beats in the 80s, uh, the forbidden beat being really what a lot of the American hardcore bands were doing, like Dead Kennedys and Minor Threat and countless other bands. And then the UK 82 movement sort of is where you see a lot more of the D beat coming into play, specifically uh, Tez Roberts, who was the drummer in um, Discharge. I mean, it was it was eye opening when I listened to the Discharge album and I'd never heard anything like it. I mean, you know, it was the fastest. It, you almost it almost felt like the drummer was struggling to keep up with what he was playing. You know, it was it was so quick. And those single stroke rolls were just it was just about getting it and then back to the beat. Um, something that I thought was great about the book was it really shone a light on female drummers. And uh, throughout the book, there were different interviews and there was this almost this theme that throughout a female drummer's career, they've had to, I don't know, almost prove more that they were worthy of the gig. And there was a there was a bit with Lynn Perko Truel who spoke about, you know, she'd often be mistaken for a groupie. And, you know, laughed at by roadies, you know, it was almost, what are you doing here? And, uh, you know, in, in, in the four words, Lucky Lur, he mentioned that, you know, growing up playing drums was considered a boy thing. You know, it was very much, this is for boys, not for girls. First of all, yeah, I have to say it was great that it kind of shone a light on female drummers, this book. Um, would you say, I mean, have you seen a change in the industry and in punk, you know, in general as to how women are treated in music absolutely i mean it was it was and i'm glad you picked up on that because it was important to me once i landed on this word perspectives within the subhead of the mm. title of the book that i be diligent to actually get some different perspectives because i came up in the 80s and if it was a book about the drummers i liked it would be a lot of west coast drummers from sst records in the early 80s right and that wouldn't be a very interesting book or it'd be a different kind of book once I challenged myself with that word perspectives, I wanted to make sure to get people uh, across the punk rock spectrum to tell me about drumming. So I didn't go in with any kind of like uh, supposition about what the book had to be about. I wanted people to tell me what it was about. And it was on it was incumbent upon me as an editor to go out and find those different viewpoints and those different perspectives and those different uh, experiences. So Lynn Perko Truel, who was in that band, The Rex, that all female band that I mentioned in like 79. They're playing shows with like DOA and Black Flag. And in, in fact, uh, they get hazed by Black Flag, the last show they ever play, which I believe was in Vancouver, where uh, Black Flag's uh, roadie uh, mugger uh, purposely detunes their instruments to kind of haze them on stage. And they play their first song. And, and her claim is, and it's probably true, that that wouldn't have happened if it was a, a band of young boys, that it was specifically because they were women that he treated them this way. She like uh, literally gets mistaken for a, a groupie and can't get backstage for her own gigs uh, when she's playing in the Dicks, uh, a hardcore band originally out of Texas and then relocated to San Francisco and they toured the US and she would experience this everywhere, right? So yeah, she had that experience. Uh, bon Von Wheelie, who plays in a band called Girl Trouble, which is much more in the garage rockabilly vein. So more think more like the Cramps or the Gun Club uh, bands like that. Um, she loved music, uh, got really turned off by the arena rock era. And then when her younger brother, who's like much younger, like nine years, maybe 10 years, maybe gets into punk rock when that's happening in the late seventies and early eighties, she goes out and buys a drum set when she's in her late twenties and takes it up and ends up playing in this band to this day. Um, but she talks about how the guy who sold her, her Ludwig drum set, um, says, you know, please don't bring this back. Please don't make me give you a refund because he's doubting her veracity. He thinks it's like some momentary midlife crisis or something, yeah. right? Which, uh, so yeah, I think there was a double standard. Uh, I do believe that that has changed. I think punk rock overall has changed. I don't think punk rock is anywhere near the boys club uh, that it was uh, maybe in the 80s. Um, and I think that there have been a lot of fantastic drummers of all stripes uh, across the decades. But if you talk to punks now, um, they're very aware. Um, they're making a real effort and they're conscious of, of making sure that everybody has a voice within this universe. And it's really impressive to watch how that's how that's evolved. Like I mentioned, Sherry Page, fantastic young female drummer. I don't think that she's really uh, I've not at least heard her talk about having to experience the kinds of things that Lynn Perko Truel had to experience as a young female drummer. So I'll just take that as a positive and hope that that is indicative of where punk rock has gone. Yeah. 
was your family musical at all? My the two older brothers that I mentioned, and you know, I like to make fun of the fact that they played a lot of heavy metal and classic rock for me. But the truth of the matter is, I'm really thankful for that because they opened my eyes to music, my ears to music at a very young age. By the time I was 12, I'd seen like Dio and Aerosmith and Def Leppard, right? They were taking me out to shows and playing a lot of stuff for me. So I was exposed to music early on. My parents did not do that. So without those older brothers, I don't know that I would have been on the path that I was on. Um, and and that, that was a really important part of my development for sure. Myself and George have spoken on here before about, for some reason, the drums just called to us. It was just yeah. the thing when we started getting into music, you know, when you hit that sort of early teens, you start hearing music, yeah, from usually from older brothers or friends, older brothers. Mm-hmm. And that was instantly what I was drawn to. It smells like teen, teen Spirit comes on and just the drum feel at the beginning. You're like, okay, yeah. well, what's that? And yeah. I, how do I do that? That's what I'm interested in. And I've, I've taken that into, you know, recording. And I was fascinated with how does how does this Rage Against the Machine album sound like this? How do they get, you know, that process? And I've spent the next 20 years trying to learn how to do that as a producer. And so, you know, your older brothers, they got you into the music. And what was then that leap for you to to getting a drum kit? Yeah, I think I was uh, 12 or 13 in that range. So would would be eighth grade, early ninth grade. Um, as I'm was, entering, was school. there resistance from the parents about wanting to become a drummer? Well, so those again, those two older brothers. I, the more I talk about it, the more I realize they shaped my entire life going forward. But um, one was a guitar player and one was a bass player. So I think that I uh, secretly, in my heart, wanted to be their drummer one day, right? So I think I, I started thinking about drums because I was like, oh, we can have a family band like the Partridges, right? Um, but I asked my parents for a drum set. They were cool about it. They got me a red sparkle CB 700 kit, but it was a snare and a rack tom, no floor. And it was a hi-hat and a crash cymbal, no ride. So I basically had the left side of a drum kit. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> and my dad, who uh, uh, really, it, now that I'm a parent, I understand where he was coming from, but he was like, okay, we got you the drum set. You can set them up in the garage but you can only play until five o'clock on weekdays and you can't play on the weekend. Yeah. Guess what time my dad got home from work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so basically he was like, you can torture your mother, but you're not torturing me. Um, but I mean, immediately I told some friends at school that I got a drum set and it was like, well, I, my older brother has a guitar and, and I've got a microphone and we were like a band within five days, right? Mm-hmm. Like, Nothing musical was happening, but we had a name and we got together and started that sort of communion that happens when yeah. friends get together and try to make music. Even if it's terrible, you still get something magical out of that. And so I've always been a drummer. Getting back to your earlier comment about watching people who just shred, who like set up a camera in their rehearsal space and just play drums, right? Along with a record, they just show you how good they are. I never did any of that. Like I, the way that I conceived of drums and the way that I continue to approach drums is I think of it as something you do with other people, preferably on a stage for a group of people who are willing to listen to you play. Um, So I'm constantly blown away by people who approach it in that way, approach drumming much more musically than I ever did. I was attracted to the overall energy of rock and roll, the overall energy of punk rock. And I felt like drums was my way in. I I just didn't have the mental or physical dexterity to learn how to play a guitar or to sit down for the many hours it took to figure out how to make things sound musical, but I could hit things real hard. Um, and, and, uh, and so I think that was my entry, but again, it was, it was hearing dead Kennedy's that made me feel brave enough to actually do that and to move forward from there. And then I just followed my instincts in terms of uh, the music that I was attracted to and did the same thing that you guys are talking about, you know, when, you know, I wanted to play like the replacements when I was really into the replacements. I wanted to play like Husker Du when I was really into Husker Du. I wanted to play like Dave Grohl when I got into Nirvana. You know, I wanted to play like Trey Cool or Travis Barker when I got into those bands. So, you know, it's 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 a pretty magical and universal thing that happens once you're attracted to an instrument and you kind of just follow your passion where it takes you. It really is earning your stripes, isn't it? Being in a band and it kind of, I wasn't good at sports, you know, so you had the, the guys who were good at sports and you had the guys good at academia and it was like, cool, well, we're going to be good at music and you're going to come watch us play. And we put our own shows on at school, you know, and convince the staff to, you know, babysit us while we, we hosted these sort of punk gigs and we're just playing covers still, but I've never, I don't think I've ever not been in a band. I think I've always, one sort of naturally ends or something happens and 
within a few months, it's like, right, let's do something else, you know, whether it's the same yeah. people, different people. That's um, the blessing yeah. and the curse of being a drummer. There's always a shortage <laughs> of people yeah. who are willing to schlep drums around, set them up, sweat yeah. for two hours, break them down and cart them away. Right. You're uh, being a drummer. You can you can explore a lot of different kinds of music because you're going to get asked to play in a lot of different kinds yeah. of bands. Yeah. My um uncle, he's not really my uncle, but a friend of the family, but he he was a drummer in the 60s and 70s and and i i actually grew up playing trombone and studied that classically and he said to me he said the trombone you know that's fine but there will always be a need for a good drummer mm. so he said so make sure you just keep going with that and you know 15 years later after uni that's what i do with my living it's drums it's and the trombone i get it out now and again if it's needed but yeah and that just always stuck with me like be a good drummer and you'll never be short of being in a band or, or having work. So I didn't play in a lot of bands with people who played trombone. So I can see where that might be. Uh... <laughs> I did. <laughs> fortunately, I think, I think I took advantage, you know, took advantage of the, uh, that wave of scar that came yes. out, you know, real big fish, yeah. less than Jake. And then <laughs> I was in real demand when that, when that sort of music broke. Right. And then I was being, you know, trying to but i wanted to play drums more in these but i actually joined a band on trombone originally and then the drummer left and i was like can i play drums and they were like no we just spent a year trying to find a trombone player yeah there's not a lot of trombonists but i really want to do drums and i auditioned in my own band (laughs) can you do both no i don't think i can do both (laughs) (laughs) i did some once a gig i was able to do a little bit and just doing kick and hi-hat pedal whilst whilst playing just for for 30 seconds but that's incredible i'd need a couple more arms you know (laughs) yeah the octopus (laughs) yeah (laughs) Um, i had a question about actual drum kits themselves over that sort of period when did we lose the second rack tom hmm i you know it's it's part of it is is what was on the market for me in my personal experience like when i upgraded from the cb 700 kit i think i got like a tama rockstar kit you know uh sort of like pressed foam <laughs> wrapped shells it wasn't wood shells and that just came from guitar center as a five-piece kit like that's what was available they didn't sell four-piece kits to my knowledge back then the sort of boxed beginner drum sets all had five pieces and i think that was very that seems like a very 70s holdover to me but i think that i learned pretty quickly and i'm assuming this is how it evolved at least in punk rock is have you guys seen the uh, documentary Every Everything about Grant Hart, the drummer and songwriter from Husker Du? No. You should see it. It's Check fantastic. It out, yeah. even, if you, even if you're not a fan of the band or any of his other solo music, it's just fascinating. He His approach to life and uh, he looked at everything through an artist's eyes. Uh, so I highly recommend it. He talks a, a lot about economy of motion. Um, so things had to be tighter because when you're playing at these faster tempos and doing a lot of accenting, you don't you can't like be jumping up and hitting heavy metal symbols that are like way up in the rafters. You need to be able to do things within a couple inches of where your snare drum are just because of the pace that you're and tempo you're playing at. So I, and I realized that, too, when I played when I started playing in bands and I got a little more adept at being able to keep a beat and and keep up with what the band was doing. It made complete sense to me to lose that second rack tom. And that's where the ride symbol goes. And the minute I made that move and saw what that did for my economy of motion, and then realized that a lot of other drummers that I really loved were already playing like that. Uh, Bunny Carlos, I think, always played a four-piece kit in Cheap Trick. Uh, Clem Burke, I think, always played a four-piece kit in Blondie and the bands that he played in. I think the Ramones, same thing. It, it, was, it was about economy of motion, and then that became its own look, right? Mm-hmm. And then I think you start to see in the late 80s and early 90s, like by the time that uh, I was briefly sponsored by Pork Pie in the 90s, that they really only put out four piece kits. I mean, you could do custom things, but almost everybody who played a pork pie kit that I saw was playing four piece kits. So I think it probably had a lot to do with just economy of motion and then that becoming its own aesthetic. And then uh, guys, we're drummers, right? So I'll just say it's easier to cart around less drums than more drums. <laughs> well, exactly. I mean, we've, <laughs> talk, we've talked about this on the show before. I mean, Ben, what you said once you did a gig and didn't take, was it you didn't take Tom's or... <laughs> There was, yeah. I don't know what the situation it was. was. A, it was a rare occurrence, but I, I, I didn't take a rack tom. I just took a 14-inch floor. I just took an 18-inch crash, and I just doubled that as a as a ride. And it was it was a pretty sort of ch- chilled-out gig, you know. 
mm-hmm. kind of half acoustic, half half full band, and it was just like I, I don't need the full. Yeah. I just don't need the full set. And actually, I mean, a lot of it was just laziness, you know, just like <laughs> yeah. what what can I get away with here? And almost a challenge, like can yeah. I can I make this work? You know, with just slightly slightly less stuff. And I think like you you said with um, Trey Cool, like I remember a drum lesson early on we were just working on kind of like improvising and my drum teacher we'd we'd play and he'd make me do a beat and then sort of improv and then he'd gradually he'd just take one bit of the kit away at a time and was like keep going you know see you, you've got less stuff to do so you're gonna have to be even more creative yeah but i also just thought eh, i can't be bothered with this particular yeah well that well that goes back to what you know rat scaby said about you know limitations leads to creativity and your own unique sound and uh yeah, it's definitely the punk way, I think. I mean, in terms of drums, I, I I don't think I've ever seen a drummer, at least in the last 20 years, a punk drummer having any more than racked. They might have two floor toms, if you're Trey Cool, but it's it's very sort of mim- minimal. And uh, yeah, it, it, it forces you to be creative, I think, as a drummer, which is, you know, fantastic. So I was going to say, this might be the trickiest question in the world and sure. one that i perhaps should have asked at the beginning but i mean how would you even describe punk drumming i mean what does punk drumming mean to you hmm oh, that's a really great question um i think it probably boils down to sort of pure crystallized energy right mm-hmm. like you are in an environment where there's probably in a 70s context less instrumentation than some of the prog rock bands or some of the metal bands were doing right uh the people playing the other instruments around you are playing less notes so there's more room for people to hear the band uh but at the same time in order to keep that energy up you have to have really driving beats even if you're going to put in a lot of flair even if you're going to put in a lot of roles the main thing is to drive the energy of the music forward so i think probably just off the top of my head i would say that energy is the key component yeah. um propulsion right yeah. and i think that it's incumbent in a band where people are playing less uh it's incumbent upon a drummer to really be in tune with what's going on around them and to be playing off of the people that they're playing with right because if you're overplaying or you're playing something stylistically that the rest of the band isn't playing it's not going to sound good everybody driving forward which the early punk bands did so masterfully uh, creates this wall of energy that you see what it does to people. They they start pogoing and then they start running into each other and they're diving off the stage because this energy that's coming off the band, a lot of which is propelled by the drummer, is undeniable. They're feeling yeah. it in their body. Yeah, definitely. And I think even just to hone in on a point you made there, something that was mentioned about Trey Cole in the book was that his his ability to match the vocal lines and the guitar lines with his kick pedal which is something I, I've always heard. You know, I've been a Green Day fan for years, but I'd never thought about it to that degree. You know, he really is, he is matching Billy Joe's lyrics and, yeah, propelling them. You know, he's not just, you know, playing a simple eighth beat fast. You know, he's really listening and going, how can I get the impact of this song to be as in your face as possible and uh yeah and i think that's that's definitely what punk drumming is to me i'd say it's it's the energy you know it's it's yeah it feels like it's almost gonna especially in those 80s bands you know discharge it feels like it's almost gonna it's like falling down the stairs you know it's 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 falling over it's it's chaotic but it it just about manages to get to the end of the two minute song all in one piece um Oh, I think it's beautiful. I, I love drumming that sounds human. I love, I'm for whatever reason, my ear has always been drawn to uh, drumming and music in general, where it just feels on the edge of the wheels falling off. Mm-hmm. Like I'm very attracted to that sort of like hint of chaos yeah. in rock and roll music of all kinds. Uh, I think the, the person you were quoting was Kai Smith, who's an Australian yes. drummer, who's a kind of a YouTube sensation or a, a has been at various points. And he does drum cover videos. Um, and, and he's fantastic because he focuses a lot on 90s drummers and getting him in the book was really important to me because it's one of the most sort of drummerly uh, contributions to the book. It's not he's not specifically talking about the lifestyle or what it's like to be in a band or the experiences he had. 
but he's deconstructing how these drummers are playing drums in these bands and why he was attracted to it as a young drummer. Um, and I love that he gives Trey Cool those props because I think that sometimes Trey Cool doesn't get the attention uh, or praise that he deserves for the kind of drumming he does. And it's because he's subtle. It's what you're talking about. You don't realize that the stuff he's doing is complicated or really well thought out and really complimentary to the music. But you guys have mentioned three drummers and we've been talking about three drummers. I do want to point out uh, that it's worth noting that Trey Cool, um, Travis Barker and Dave Grohl all played in trios. Uh, mm -hmm. Playing in a trio is a little bit different than playing in a four piece or a five piece because you uh, you and the bass player have to do a lot more work to hold the song together and to make things interesting on stage. And you're much more in charge of those kind of accents that are going to be shining through because there's only one guitar up there that you're uh, playing in counterpoint or playing along to. And so I've always found that drummers that play in trios have a sort of different role to play. And consequently, their drumming is going to be a little bit different than what you might hear in a four piece or a five piece. I'm in a three piece at the moment. And, uh, yeah. I'm dragging those boys along with me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> come on, lads. I've got, uh, I got some spaces to fill here, you know? Yeah. Um, I'd like to just quickly chat about um, one of your old bands, um, Saw. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I was doing some research and I was like, the name rings a bell. And this was sort of late 90s, wasn't it? Crossing over into 2000s. Yeah, our first record came out in 2000, and I think the second record came out in 2003 or four. And so I, I, I went on Spotify, and I was like, right, I'll listen to one of your tracks, and I was like, oh, I recognize this song. And it was on a James Gunn film. Yeah. Uh, Super. And I was like, oh, yeah, I love this song when I saw the film, you know. Um, and I guess, like, looking back, you know, for me, you know, my peak era of... of music is is that late 90s it's the noughties that's mm -hmm. you know when i was a teenager and heading into early 20s and i guess you know you guys were signed to a major and and i'd just love to have a quick insight into sort of at that that point in time like what was it like being in that sort of position and oh, well it, uh, people rightly who who are aware of these things, people who are aware of what the, what was happening to the music industry right then or, or about to happen to the music industry, will often say we were one of the last bands to be able to make one of those big production records. Right? right? It was yeah. Stupid expensive. We spent so is this a bunch just of kind money. of pre Napster. Is, is this like is it Napster that kind of just happening? Just, yeah. just, it's just starting to happen. And the uh, in fact. And yeah. One of the ways they marketed uh, our album, the first album, when we were signed to Hollywood Records, was a couple of the songs were came loaded into one of the very early MP3 players. That, right. you know, yeah. It holds yeah. 150 songs, and we're going to load it with 10 of bands you've never heard of. But you can erase them, don't worry. Um, yeah, I mean, we made that we made that record with Rob Cavallo, who was our A&R guy, but he was also the producer on the record. He was just coming off of winning a Grammy uh, for Green Day, because he had produced a, a bunch of the more famous Green Day records, including like Dookie. And uh, we recorded it at all the top end studios in, in Los Angeles. And from a drummer's perspective, I, I always tell this story. It's the first time I ever had anybody else doing They set up my drums for me. They tuned my drums for me. They were like, this snare, this snare, this snare. It was like unbelievable. I'd never had any of that. Like, I'm a guy who like had beat up drum sets and tuned with, you know, duct tape, right? Like, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I was like a, a complete like self-taught hack. And then I had all this world-class equipment to the point where the drum tech was like, do you want to play on the snare drum that was used for November rain? And I was like, well, I should at least hit it. Right. Uh, and the first day of tracking, uh, they, they were like, okay, the drums are all set up. We've been getting sounds for like, you know, in my memory, it feels like it was two days or 18 hours of just rack, rack, rack floor floor full like, and it's like we finally got to the place we're going to roll tape and we're going to record and it's like all right we're going to bring the click up just come in when you're comfortable and then it goes quiet for a second and everybody's in the studio looking at me and then someone hits the the talk back mic and says by the way you're set up where john bonham was set up for like let's up one three <laughs> no pressure right um which I say all of that in retrospect, because like, obviously the band didn't sell a trillion records and we're not a household name, but we really had this experience that was indicative of the, what the music industry used to be. After that, we quickly get into an era where people 
are moving into digital recording, which was kind of a new thing that literally happened in the middle of the record. I think we tracked drums to tape. And then there was like, we're going to bring in a computer guy and he's going to run, you know, whatever. And so like in the middle of making that record, things were already transitioning. And then you get, you get away from the era of big studios, lots of engineers, huge mixing boards. So it was definitely the end of an era. It was really great to be able to have gotten to that point and get to have that experience uh, because I don't think it's an experience that a lot of musicians get to have anymore. And, and like I said, we never sold any records and we're not a household name, but we got to do some interesting things. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. Yeah. And, thank uh, you so much for your time. Oh, thank you guys yeah. for having me on. I really appreciate it. No, it's brilliant. And it's this book, I mean, I can't promote it enough. It's, it's just, I learned, you know, a hell of a lot reading this because I feel like my punk knowledge was, you know, it was the punk pop punk guys. And then I sort of delved a bit into sex pistols and the clash, but, but yeah, it's opened me, you know, to discharge and all these other bands that I would never have listened to. So, um, yeah, it's been uh, it's been great talking to you. It's been great reading this book. Um, how can people find out about you, and where should they where should they look? On your I socials? think probably the easiest place is Twitter or um, Instagram. I'm S W Loudon, so S W L A U D E N. That's the easiest place to find out what's going on, either about this book or any music that I'm still involved in, or, you know, I also write for the big takeover, which is a punk fanzine out of New York. So you can see my latest articles there. Uh, I have a author website, but I'm terrible at keeping it up to date. So maybe social media is the best place. Well, we'll definitely point people in the direction of your, yourself and, and your book. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for, for, for joining us. Thanks you guys. I really appreciate it. So yeah, that was our chat with, um, Steve. Steve. Yeah. yeah. Fascinating, Fascinating isn't it? Insight. Yeah. His his knowledge of punk music is uh and punk drumming is yeah. great. You know, ask him a question on anything and yeah. Yeah, I mean the the drummers and the bands he knew. Whew. Yeah. I exactly. mean extensive. Yeah. Extensive. And it seems like he's um had a pretty good career as a drummer. Yeah, definitely. You know. Definitely. And uh, I'm very jealous that he lives in LA, California. I know. Especially today. And to be rainy. in a band like that, you know, on a major label in the late nineties, early noughties. I mean yeah. oh, what a yeah. time. What yeah. a time. Yeah. Um but George, just remind everyone the name of the book, please. The name of the book is Forbidden Beat Perspectives on Punk Drumming. Um and yeah, best thing to do if you want to check um out Steve's stuff, go to S W Loudon. L A U D E N dot com. That's his website on there. It's got a link where you can buy this book. He's also written some other books. Yeah. Which we didn't ask him about, but I no. had a look. And there he's written a series of three sort of crime mystery novels. Yeah. And the I think the protagonist is a punk drummer who moonlights as a private investigator. I love that. Yeah. And they've yeah. got some really good reviews. Yeah. So go check him out. Also go find Steve on Twitter and Instagram. I think it's at SW Lorden. Yep. Um, but yeah, fascinating. What the hell is that? You got tossed into the right dumpster. Oh, right, this is the Zykit or Zikit yep. add on system, right? That you put on your snare drum. And yeah, it looks quite mental. But yeah. You add it onto your snare drum, and then with just one turn of a key on this system, you can just instantly change your snare tuning with three different preset sounds. Yeah. So you essentially have a low tuning, a mid tuning, and a high tuning, and you just turn this one key to switch between all three. That's insane, isn't it? I mean, we've talked yeah. about tuning things before on the show, but that, I mean, I'm just looking at the pictures now. It is sort of, it goes in. Looks like it snare? should be in a saw film. Yeah. Like one of them ones that goes around the neck that's going to like blow your head off. Yeah. I'm sure it doesn't come with a bomb attached. No, but well, let's hope not. Yeah, it looks like quite, it's quite a big system. Yeah, it is. Um, I'm guessing, yeah, it goes kind of in the snare and round the, under the rim though. Yeah. You put the rim on top maybe, or maybe it replaces the rim. But it says here you can install the Zykit virtually any 14 inch snare drum mm. and effectively provide yourself with a low medium high tuning presets there's a 
Pro kit, which uh, I will say it's not cheap. Yeah, yeah, three hundred dollars. But you know, but if it if it works and it's worth it, you know, it's uh, surely yeah. it's surely it's some good kit to have. The only the my only worry with all these things. Go is, on, yeah. Does it? Does I know it? You get worried. Oh, I'm so worried. I'm up all night going. Oh, are these tuning things working? Oh, yeah, I can't cool. sleep. Yeah. No. Uh, what I get worried about is. Does it, you know, make you not have to learn how to tune a snare drum? You know, if there's a preset, because we talked before about, you know, uh, almost frequency tuners, especially with the drum tech for Blondie. But he was using that almost as a sort of um, like a beginning point, a starting point. And then he found a good sound beyond that. Whereas this, it looks, I mean, I could be wrong, but it looks very like... You know, you want a low sounding snare, you tune it to that, and then that is it, you know? But if it works and it sounds good, who am I to judge? I'm just thinking about like playing a gig mm. with my band, you know, where we do lots of different songs with different artists, you know, at a wedding. Yeah. And it's like, would that be useful? Was there would there be a song where actually it would be better to have a low tuned snare? Yeah, yeah. Quickly. And are there songs where it would be better to have a high pitched snare? Yeah. You know, so you can just quickly change the sound slightly to suit the genre you're playing. Yeah. And I guess especially if you're doing a sort of cover gig, cover band mm. gig with lots of different artists, mm. that's where it's going to be. Definitely. You know, maybe a bit more useful. I like yeah, that Yeah, like it, you know, $300. If I want to try it out, you'll have to send me one for free. Yeah. Because <laughs> I'm not paying that. But best of Prove luck to you. Wrong. Yeah. Prove us wrong, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Right. I'm going to go and uh, practice my D beat. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I'm going to go uh, practice drums. <laughs> drums in general. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I hope you enjoy today. Uh, yeah. Especially yeah. If go you're check a new out listener. Steve's website. Go follow me on social media. Um, yeah. We'll put links and stuff into the episode description. Um, mm. Go buy his book. Yeah. It's brilliant. It is and genuinely brilliant. Anything you want to ask us? Hit us up, Twitter, at Bull Drummers, Instagram, at Drum and Drummer Podcast. Send us an email. How are you doing? How's summer treating you? Because mm. we're sort of in summer now. Yep. What's yeah. your favorite delivery service? We haven't, yes, we haven't let done us that know. bit yeah. in a while. So actually, I followed, from our Twitter account, I followed DPD. Mm. And the amount of complaints I see. Yeah. But also as well, people aren't tweeting going, yep, delivery was successful. Yeah. When you get it, you don't go. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'll, I'll let them know. But there was one where I don't know whether it's a bot doing the replies, but someone's being like, DPD are a fucking joke. <laughs> I was in the ass and I didn't get my fucking parcel. Can your driver actually ring the fucking doorbell? I and think that might be me, yeah. DPD reply is like, we're very, you know, it's a classic sort of corporate. We're very sorry to hear you think of this. If you could DM us, we would be in touch. Right. And I didn't know whether it was like a bot, an automated thing. Or there's someone writing them out who just wasn't paying attention. But one of them was praising DPD. <laughs> and then the reply was like, we're very sorry about your experience with DPD. Please get in touch. It's like, no, they were saying it was yeah, good. Yeah, they yeah. were saying you were the only good bit. Come on, wake up. <laughs> They're used to it. Should we wrap it up? Let's wrap it up, boy. Yeah, thank yeah. you very much for listening. Um, yep. And we'll see you next time here on Drum and Drummer. Bye. Thank you for listening to Drum and Drummer. You can find us on Instagram at Drum and Drummer Podcast. And you can send us an email to drumanddrummerpod at gmail.com. Remember, just pick up the sticks and twat it.